among the shoppers on the main street, stole a few soldiers on leave from nearby bases, and up on the hill at the university, some Air Force people in the Russian language. But mostly, the town is civilian, mostly industry. Busy building, busy growing, the city willingly forgets an ugly war in favor of a hopeful peace. But it was not always thus. In World War II, the city was a large and active air base. This is part of it. This was a bomber base, built to look like farms and farmland, camouflaged so cleverly that chicken coops stood out on runways between flights. You could hardly tell what it was then. Now you can hardly remember. A new civilian airport stands here now, a place for travelers or sportsmen, or a place to come for Sunday dinner. Yet all of this must be protected still from enemy air attacks. The airport the people, and indeed the city. Ten years after peace was made, the threat of war has not entirely lifted from the land. Here as elsewhere, the Air Force guards American skies. But the job is endlessly enormous, and help is welcome. Some cities provide their own defense. In Syracuse, New York, October 1st, 1954, two aircraft on call during the 14 daylight hours star fires Lockheed F-94s. They are ready to go. In each tip tank, 230 gallons of fuel to mix with beaten air and fire. Alongside the starters operated by ground crews on alert duty with the pilots. Canopies contain the pilot's atmosphere, pressurized and air conditioned. Depending on your viewpoint, they are beautiful or ugly. A squadron involves more than two alert aircraft. If the star fires in readiness develop mechanical trouble, they are replaced by another aircraft from the line. In an emergency, every airplane in the squadron would be used. It would take time to put them up, but time measured in hours, not days. For this squadron is ready. It is well equipped, and day by day it is polished and brushed and tightened, inspected and painted in oil to keep it ready. Thirty men divide the chores. It's a full-time job keeping those ships going. For one thing, you've got to have parts. Sometimes, if we don't have them, we have to make them. These aircraft get mighty demanding, especially when they're on alert, and they just have to work. You take radios. A pilot can get awful lonesome and lost with the radio on the blink. Or the afterburner. This is what kicks the jet off the ground. Inspecting it now means that some pilot will have it when he really needs it. Naturally, the guns need attention. This is called bore sighting. You prop the aircraft up on jacks and then zero the guns in. Just like setting a rifle in a box to adjust the sight. Except that a Starfire is a mighty big rifle and it shoots 1,250 rounds a minute. Mostly, the business of air defense is waiting. Pilots waiting for a call to scramble, listening to the ticking of a teletype. Starfires weigh 10 tons, but they can be humbled by a storm. So weather forecasts become intensely personal to the pilots, more so even than rain on a new hat. Much of the time is spent reading or talking about flying. Some of the time is given over to more urgent matters. That's Captain Tyson doing the honors. During their seven hours on alert duty, the pilots wear flying clothes, eating and sleeping in the day room. If the alarm sounds, they are ready to fly. Many of the pilots are civilians flying for the guard in their spare time. George Slanky is one, a man with a family. He's also a scoutmaster in an air scout troop. George is an engineer at an air conditioning plant in town and a captain in the guard. Scheduling his flying to fit in with his engineering presents a problem sometimes, but still another problem comes to mind. A man like George Smanky, a civilian, why does he elect to go aloft in dangerous, uncomfortable jets for the National Guard? I guess the primary reason I'm in the Guard is because I like to fly. I don't mind the money a bit either. Satisfying to know that if, that if we did have an attack on the country, I could get up there and do something about it. A couple of us here perhaps wouldn't make much of a dent in uh, attacking formation, but you take two here and two there and all over the country, and I think we could put up a good show. National Guard pilots on an intercept get directions from Air Force radar or from the Ground Observer Corps. 
Here is a filter center where civilian volunteers spot information telephoned by other GOC spotters standing watch at hundreds of observation posts in the area, searching the sky for potential attackers. Within shouting distance of the day room, an alert desk. If radar finds an unidentified plane in the area, a call from the Air Force comes in on a direct line. This is how a scramble happens. From Air Force radar comes the call, scramble two. Before anything else, a button is pushed, a switch thrown. One sounds a bell in the civilian tower. Traffic is frozen. The other starts the hangar alarm. Within half a minute, the aircraft will be rolling. Within three minutes, they will be off the ground in quest of the unknown. Lockheed Starfires are two-man aircraft designed to be flown by a pilot and a radar observer. The National Guard still lacks sufficiently trained radar men, so the pilots go up alone. Crew chiefs help them into elaborate harnesses. To escape a crippled plane, the pilot must shoot himself out, seat and all. Auxiliary power units spin the aircraft's turbines to starting speed. Most of the time getting off the ground is consumed by a long trip between the hangar and the runway. While the planes are taxiing, they get their first directions from radar relayed through their own operations desk. Red Dog Leader, this is Red Dog Operations, Scramble Vector 306, target Angel 20. The vector is a compass point direction. Angel 20 means 20,000 feet. moment, the flight leader will be put in direct contact with Air Force radar. Red Dog Leader, this is Red Dog Operations. Contact Gingerbread on Channel 4. Gingerbread is the code name for the radar station. Now the radio link is achieved. Gingerbread, this is Red Dog Leader, airborne with two, vector 306. Roger, Red Dog Leader. This is Gingerbread. Continue Vector 306, targeted Angels 20. Gingerbread, this is Red Dog. Continuing Vector 306, now passing Angels 10. Roger, Red Dog. Target now heading 107 at 12 o'clock, 40 miles, Angels 20. This is the target, making its way through an open sky. Roger, Gingerbread. This is Red Dog, now at Angels ground speed, four and sixty knots, no contact. This is Gingerbread, target now one o'clock at twenty miles, passing port to starboard. Gingerbread, this is Red Dog, now steady on course at Angels 20, no contact. Red Dog leader, this is Gingerbread. Now starboard 8-0, when steady on, target will be 11-30 at 15 miles. When steady on, target will be 11-30 at 15 miles. Target now 11-30, 10 miles, passing port to starboard. Roger, gingerbread, tally ho. This is Red Dog. Target is friendly, Baker 25. Jam or reality, the pilots never know which. 
This was an exercise in cooperation between airborne huntsmen and their electronic eyes on the ground. Clearly, this was a practice mission. Now it is clear. But at the takeoff, every mission is the real thing. A pilot cannot assume otherwise. Quite literally, he may have the fate of his city in his hands. As soon as the aircraft are parked, four ground crewmen descend on them. Much work must be done quickly before they are ready to fly again. They must be inspected, a hasty but revealing visual examination by men who know what to look for. Then oxygen bottles must be recharged. Oil levels must be checked. And the aircraft must be refueled. Each Starfire holds 783 gallons. Turnaround time is an important figure. It is the elapsed time between the aircraft's return and the moment they are ready to fly again. 138 fighter squadron crews must do their work in 15 minutes or less. Again, as before, the mission was rehearsal. The pilots write it off to training. Or they admit that on a limpid, cloud-flecked day, flying is fun. Now they return to the day room again, where they will wait for further practice or to meet the moment. <laughs>